In this video, we're going to discuss Putnam 2019 number B3, and a solution that exploits a theorem that's not often used in solutions presented to the Putnam, but that I've noticed comes up as a possible way to approach a lot of different Putnam problems. So stay tuned for an interesting solution to this linear algebra Putnam problem. Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof Omar. This channel is dedicated to undergraduate mathematics problems and theorems, for your experience through the undergraduate, and to prepare you for your experiences beyond. If this resonates with you and this is your first time on the channel, definitely click the subscribe button for more related videos. Today we're going to discuss Putnam 2019 number B3. And this is a linear algebra problem that states the following. If you're given a matrix Q, and you know that it satisfies this property right here, which is also known as Q being orthogonal, meaning Q transpose Q is the same as Q, Q transpose is the identity. Here, all the identities are going to be the N by N identity matrix. And you have this other matrix P that's the identity minus twice U, U transpose, where U is a vector in Rn, and U happens to be a unit vector, so U transpose U is 1. The problem asks to prove that if 1 is not an eigenvalue of this matrix Q, then one has to be an eigenvalue of PQ. Now the thing that's interesting is there are many solutions out there, but the solution I'm going to present actually exploits this interesting theorem about determinants. So we're going to rephrase this in terms of determinants and then use that theorem. And this is actually a solution that one of my friends, Stephen Klee, who is a professor at Seattle University, uh, came up with when he was proctoring the uh, Putnam exam at his institution. And the interesting part about this solution is it's actually going to exploit the matrix determinant lemma. And this is a lemma that I've used in several other videos and that I've noticed is really useful on various linear algebra Putnam problems. So we'll see how it's useful in this problem as well. So to start, what I'm going to do is think about um, this statements we're trying to prove and write them in terms of determinants. So this first statement says that one is not an eigenvalue of Q. And this statement says that 1 is, is an eigenvalue of PQ. That's the implication we want to have as a consequence. Um, okay, so let's think about eigenvalues in terms of determinants. Now, if you have a general matrix A and you want to compute the eigenvalues, one thing that you can do is determine the values lambda for which the determinant of A minus lambda I is 0. All right, so another way to phrase this is that lambda is an eigenvalue if lambda satisfies this equation right here. So the statement that one is not an eigenvalue of Q is the same as saying that the determinant of Q minus one times the identity is non-zero. Or in other words, the determinant of Q minus I is not zero. All right, and so the statement that one is an eigenvalue of PQ is the statement that the determinant of PQ minus the identity is zero. Again, here lambda being one as the eigenvalue that's being talked about in both statements. So what we want to prove then is that the determinant of Q minus I is non-zero implies that the determinant of PQ minus I is zero. Okay, so we're going to rephrase the problem in this way and I want to make the additional observation that a matrix having a non-zero determinant means that the matrix is invertible. It's actually equivalent to that. So we can even rephrase this as saying Q minus I is invertible implies that the determinant of PQ minus I is zero. And so this is what we're trying to prove. Okay, so I'm going to start with playing with the matrix PQ minus I which we were trying to find, uh, establish that it has zero determinant. Now we have an explicit formula for what P is in terms of this original vector U, so let's write that out. We have I minus twice U U transpose times Q minus the identity. And now if we expand this out, we have uh, Q, and then we have a negative identity, uh, and then we're subtracting 2U times U transpose Q. All right, so this is the thing we're trying to find the determinant of and establish that the determinant is zero. Now, determinants of sums of matrices are not necessarily a nice thing to work with. However, we have this information that this matrix right over here is invertible. 
right? And this is a product of some vector right over here. Maybe I'll encapsulate the negative as well. I'll call this vector x, and then another vector right over here, uh, which is the transpose of an, a vector in Rn. So I'll call it y transpose. And let's call this matrix right over here A. So this expression is the matrix A plus x times the transpose of the vector y. Now the thing about the matrix determinant lemma is it actually lets you express the determinant of something like this as a product of the determinant of A, if A is invertible, and an actual number. So that's useful for us because we know something about the determinant of Q minus I. So what the matrix determinant lemma says is that if you have a setup like this, the determinant of A plus X times Y transpose is the determinant of A times this scalar quantity right over here, which is 1 plus Y transpose A inverse X. If you want to see a development of why this is true, check out this video right over here that I made earlier about the matrix determinant lemma. Okay, so in that light, the determinant then of this quantity, PQ minus I, which we're trying to prove is zero, is the determinant of this thing, which by the matrix determinant lemma is the determinant of Q minus I times the quantity one, we have this negative two here that's gonna come out um, regardless of what we're doing, uh, times now Y transpose, so that's U transpose Q, uh, times a inverse, and A is this matrix right over here, so that's Q minus I inverse, uh, and then multiplied by X. And I've encapsulated the negative two over here, so I can just have a U right over here. Okay, we're trying to prove this quantity here is zero. Uh, so since this is a non-zero number, what we're really trying to do is prove that this quantity right over here is explicitly zero. And if you look at it again, this is, in the setup, this thing here is a vector that is one by n because we're transposing. This is an n by n matrix. This here is a n by one matrix because this is a column vector. And so this whole thing is an actual scalar. So this thing here is an actual physical number. And so we're trying to prove that this thing is zero. If we manage to prove this is zero, then this has to be zero. In fact, if we think about it, since the problem tells us that PQ has to have one as an eigenvalue, then it must be the case that this quantity is going to forcibly be zero. So given our setup, we have to try to find a way to establish that this quantity right over here is in fact zero, and that's gonna be the focus of the rest of the problem. So I'm gonna erase all the work that we've done from the matrix determinant lemma, and write down that our goal is to show that this quantity right here is actually zero. Okay, so this is our goal here that we've reduced our problem to. Um, and I wanna simplify things a little bit. We have this complicated expression. I'm gonna let this entire piece right over here be V. That'll make our calculations likely uh, a little bit simpler. Um, so we'll write down here in our corner that the information that we have is that V is this thing, which we can rewrite by multiplying by Q minus V as saying that U is the matrix Q minus I times V. All right, so let's play around and see uh, what it is that we can do to establish the thing that we want. Um, so another way to word what we're trying to prove is if we put all this stuff in parentheses, we're really trying to prove that U transpose QV is a half, right? If we rearrange everything here and isolate for U transpose QV, we would get that it's a half. So our goal then is to prove that the quantity U transpose QV is one half. Okay. All right, so let's look at the quantity U transpose QV. We have a few ways that we can look at it. So I've actually expanded here uh, QI minus Q minus I times V as QV minus V. So one approach is to literally substitute in U in terms of V, play around and see what we get. So there we would have something like, maybe I'll write it over here, uh, we'd have something like Q, the quantity Q minus I V 
all transposed times QV. Okay, if we do that, we would get um, transposes multiplied in the other direction. So we'd get V transpose Q minus I all transpose QV. Uh, and then transposes distribute over sums and differences. So this would be Q transpose minus the identity because the identity transposes itself times QV, which is V transpose times Q transpose Q minus Q times V distributing um, this product. Okay, so here this substitution we have everything in terms of V. Now, we know that Q transpose Q is the identity, so we can rewrite this as V transpose times the identity minus Q times V. All right, and what remains here is to maybe even simplify this a little bit more and recognize that uh, I minus Q is the negative of Q minus I. So this entire thing is actually the negative of this vector, so it's negative U. So this quantity is negative V transpose U. So it feels like we didn't simplify things too much, but we at least got the contribution of Q out of this expression, so we have one way to look at this thing. That might help. Okay, so going down this chain, we decided to make the substitution where we substituted in U in terms of V. We could have done something else. We could have recognized that because U is QV minus V, QV can be written in terms of U and V themselves, right? So we would have something like U transpose it times QV, which is U plus V, if we rearrange this equation here. Now writing that out, we get U transpose U plus U transpose V, which is because U transpose U is 1, equal to 1 plus U transpose V. Okay, so this thing here is actually a scalar. So if we transposed it, we'd get the same thing. In fact, U transpose V will have to be V transpose U because the transpose of this is V transpose, U transpose transpose. So this thing here is 1 plus V transpose U. Okay, so we're noticing here, if we look at the thing that's underlined, that's the same as this thing, but this entire expression is the same as this which is the same as this. So these two quantities right over here have to actually be equal to each other. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means that 1 plus V transpose U is the negative of V transpose U. Um, so if we set an equation, we'd get that V transpose U should be a negative a half, right? 1 plus something is negative of that. Um, so that forces these two quantities to actually be a negative a half which then means that this quantity, which is equal to these entire expressions, um, is itself a half. And that's exactly what we wanted right over here. One of the things I actually like about this approach is at every step of the way, we actually knew things had to work out the way they did. For example, this thing here was the quotient of the determinant of PQ minus I over the determinant of Q minus I. And we knew Q minus I had non-zero determinant. We were trying to prove that determinant of PQ minus I was zero. So we knew this would be forced to be zero somehow, right? And so as a consequence, this inner quantity right over here, we knew had to be a half before we even did anything. And so the rest of the problem was sort of massaging things to try to figure out why this thing actually was a half. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please click the like button. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications on future videos.